Well, brethren, it is very good to be back here with you and to see you once again. We're in the third or in the second of the three annual festival seasons. This is, of course, the Pentecost season, and uh, the day of Pentecost itself uh, is tomorrow. And we have focused on uh, various things that uh, normally that, that uh, tie in with the holy days and with the meaning of these annual occasions, because God demonstrates to us through the annual occasions His plan and His purpose. And we're reminded from year to year of the great plan that God is working out because uh, He has given us these three seasonal occasions. Uh, There are, of course, the the early spring uh, festivals, the first season, the Passover season, uh, during which the Passover occurs, and then the two holy days, Uh, the first day and the last day of the Days of Unleavened Bread. Uh, Then the Pentecost season, which really is the pivot season of the uh, the three, uh, God tells us, you know, we're to appear before Him three times, or these three seasons in the year, these uh, three periods when we come before Him. And we come to to Pentecost, uh, which uh, uh, is, as we mentioned, coming tomorrow, and then uh, the fall festival season. And as soon as uh, Pentecost is passed, we'll be getting the uh, festival planner, and it will have all the details for the fall festival season, particularly for the Feast of Tabernacles. And and so God uh, outlines in His plan uh, through these occasions, and we're reminded and we're focused in, and we're kept mindful as we go through it. And uh, that is very uh, important. Now, there are several things that are connected, of course, with the day of Pentecost. Uh, As we go through the Scriptures, we find that that ties in with the original giving of the Ten Commandments, with the covenant that God made with Israel at Mount Sinai, the making of the Old Covenant, as it were, and then uh, coming on down uh, into the New Testament, we find that there are, we find the details there in Acts chapter 2 of the first Pentecost of the New Testament. Era, the time when God began to make a new covenant, when he poured out his spirit, as recorded there in Acts chapter 2, and God began the process of making a new covenant with his people. Now, there has been, of course, great confusion that uh, uh, the world has always had, and some uh, of the people of God have have become confused in terms of of the distinction between the old and new covenant, Uh, and uh, don't fully are not fully aware of that, nor have become uh, confused and sort of balled up in their in their thinking. I want us, uh, we're not going to entirely focus just on, on that, but I want us to focus in on certain aspects uh, that can help us understand and sort of set the stage for the day of Pentecost, uh, because it is important that we uh, clearly understand what constitutes true and acceptable worship of God. As we come here at this Pentecost season, and as we think in terms of the old covenant that God made with with ancient Israel at Mount Sinai, or the new covenant that God began to make, and understand, a lot of people don't realize this, the new covenant has not been, is, is not uh, completely made. The new covenant is in the process of being made. Because, you know, God says in Hebrews 8, which was a quote from back in Jeremiah, this is the covenant that I will make with them in those days, says the Lord. I will write my laws into their hearts and into their minds, and they shall be to me a people, and I'll be to them a God. And then he goes right on down and he says, and they'll teach no more every man his neighbor, saying, know the Lord, for they will all know me from the greatest to the least. Brethren, have we arrived at that point? Do you have the law of God perfectly and completely and totally written in your hearts and in your mind? Is the first thing that always pops into your mind the most godly response? Or does sometimes another response pop up and you think, no, no, I can't do that, that's not right. You know, go pray, repent, go try to do what you're supposed to do. Is the law of God totally, completely written in your hearts and in your minds? Or is it, you know, being written? And some parts of it are maybe a little more legible than others. Uh, Some of it is maybe written with a little lighter hand. Uh, And you have to sort of go back and look at it and think, no, no, not supposed to do this, supposed to do that. Does everyone know the Lord from the greatest to the least? No. Well, the world's filled with people that don't even begin to know God. They don't even know about Him, much less know Him. And there is a difference between knowing about Him and knowing Him. 
But see, most of the world doesn't even know about him. Much less really know him. See, there are a lot of people you and I know about. There are people we've read about, people we may have a lot of even accurate information about. But we don't know them because we've never had personal contact and a personal relationship. See, the people you really know are the ones that you have a personal relationship with, the ones you've had personal contact with. There are other people that we may say, well, I know about him. I, I've heard about him and, and well, I've heard about him uh, you know, all my life. Uh, and, and, and this person and that person and, and this other one said something about him. You know, sometimes you meet somebody and, and, and you feel like, well, boy, I've, you know, I've heard all kinds of stories about you. You know, that, that, boy, that, uh, sometimes that happens to me and I wonder what stories they've heard. Uh, you know, who, who told you? That, that, that's the good guy, see. Uh, but the world doesn't even know about God. At least a large percentage of it doesn't in terms of really accurate information about the true God. Uh, but a uh, far, far smaller uh, of those who know about uh, the, the true God really know God. So we're not to the point where the new covenant is completed. The new covenant is in the process of being made. Now, as we are at this point, and as our mind naturally turns to the covenants, to God's law, to God's spirit, to what is true and acceptable worship of God, is there a difference in terms of what constitutes true worship of God? Is there a difference under the old covenant and under the new? Is there a difference in what is acceptable worship of God? Did they have one set of rules that made for acceptable worship of God under the Old Covenant? Totally different set of rules for acceptable worship of God under the New Covenant. Well, I think it's very important that we understand this matter, uh, that we understand what really is true and acceptable worship of God and how that ties in and relates to us personally and relates to this day of Pentecost. Now, one of the things that people have looked to and that religion has played a big role in is the desire that all of us as human beings have for security. We live in an insecure world and there's nothing that makes you realize how insecure it is any more than to be struck by a sudden disaster, uh, maybe a uh, uh, you know, it can be anything from a from a hurricane to a flood, as you've been reading and seeing probably on television, the flooding up in the Midwest. Uh, my son, uh, older son, uh, recently talked to a friend of his out in the Northwest, and their home had burned within the last week. And uh, boy, you know, you realize things can just be snuffed out in a moment. And uh, it can be a storm, it can be a fire. Uh, you look at uh, uh, the unexpected tragedies that happen, whether it's an automobile accident or whether it is uh, a health problem, uh, someone is suddenly diagnosed as having cancer or having uh, this or that, or they have a heart attack, whatever it may be. And we realize that things really aren't that secure in the world where we live, and, and add to that uh, the fact that, uh, the cr that the crime rate is going out the ceiling. Uh, there are plenty of streets that you and I don't want to walk down, certainly not at night, and uh, really wouldn't want to spend a whole lot of time there in the daytime, you know. Uh, certain certain areas, certain sections, it can be dangerous. There's a lot of insecurity in the world in which we live, and, and this is one of the things, this is one of the roles religion has always played, because people from the beginning have been faced with things that happen, with events that overpower them and events over which they have no control. And so religion is looked to as a source of security, but you have to conclude that the religion most have had has not really provided the security for which they've hoped. Now, people uh, have different things. You know, some people carry around, uh, uh, used to, maybe more than they, than they do now, but, you know, they had uh, good luck charms, had a rabbit's foot. Boy, that was going to bring them good luck. They ought to stop and consider how much luck did it bring to the rabbit. Uh, you know, where was the rest of him? Uh, they, they had his foot and the rest of him was uh, somewhere else. So uh, that, that's not too lucky. Uh, but, you know, people have uh, have their uh, their good luck charms. And it may be uh, anything from 
uh, seeing a car, you know, with uh, a rosary beads or St. Christopher's medal uh, hanging from the uh, rear view mirror to, uh, uh, you know, just various things, different, you could go to different societies, different cultures, and the idea that somehow you could hold on to something that is a source of security. Now that is an attitude that has been extant for a long time. There is an interesting account that we read back in the first few chapters of the book of First Samuel. Now, you remember the story of Samuel. Uh, his birth was extraordinary because his parents had been unable to have children. And there was a time when they had come up to Shiloh, which was God's headquarters at that time. That's where Joshua had set up the tabernacle and the ark. Uh, of the covenant was uh, there in the tabernacle. The ark was set up in Shiloh after Israel had come into the promised land and had settled there. And so people came up to Shiloh every year for the festival. And Samuel's parents were there for the feast. And his mother uh, was praying. And when Eli, the high priest, came in and saw her, uh, she was, uh, he thought at first that she had been drinking. And then when he spoke to her, he realized, no, she was just very uh, emotional, very emotionally distraught and, and upset. And he talked to her a little bit, and he found that uh, uh, what she was praying about, and that was she was praying for a son. Now, I just might pause here for a second, because it's not really the main point of the, of the sermon, but there is a lesson I think we can learn. You know, Eli jumped to a conclusion, and we all jump to conclusions sometimes, uh, and his conclusion was based upon uh, what he saw. Uh, you might just notice it here in 1 Samuel 1, uh, verse 12. It came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. Now, Hannah, she spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. E Therefore, Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said, uh, how long are you going to be drunk? Put away the wine. Put, put away the wine. He uh, talks to her about her drinking. He jumped to a conclusion, didn't he? He assumed. Now, we've all, do, we've all done that from time to time. You see somebody and you say, well, I saw them. Well, just the fact you saw them, you may have seen them, but you know we don't always know all the facts and we sometimes uh, we fill in details in our mind. He saw her, that's right, she was there. And, uh, uh, but Hannah answered, uh, told him in verse 15, you know, no, my Lord, I'm a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I've drunk neither wine nor strong drink. I poured out my soul before the eternal. And uh, so then Eli, when he talked to her, he realized that he was mistaken in his first judgment. And, and brethren, that would solve a lot of the misunderstandings and the problems that come up, come up in your families, come up in the church from time to time, come up among friends. You know, we see someone, we hear someone, and we come to a conclusion. And we go away with our conclusion. A lot of times, if you just go to the person and talk to them, you'll find out that you may have seen what you thought you saw, but what it meant could be vastly different than, than what you thought. You know, we, we build up things in our mind about others. We don't communicate. We feel somehow that we can't go to them and talk to them about it. And so it, it just builds up and it, and, it, and it sort of festers and we, we assign motives and we do some of these things that, that are not good uh, because uh, that's See, God is the only one who, who really understands what the motives are. You may look at someone, you may see that they've done this or done that, but you don't know always what they meant or what their motives were. And we have to be careful. And this is just an example uh, in passing. And I, I bring it out just because I, I think it's good that we note that and we realize that when we go through passages of Scripture, it's important to look for lessons we can learn and examples and illustrations that can help us to maybe see circumstances in which we fit sometimes. It's an important part of studying the Bible. It's not just a matter of technical information. That's where meditation comes in. When you read something, you think about it, and you consider how you might fit into circumstances like that. Well, anyway, the story is, of course, that Hannah was praying for a son. She was had made a promise to God that if he would give her a child, she would 
uh, return the child to him. Uh, Eli told her to go in peace, that God would grant her uh, would grant her petition, and in due time she did conceive and bear a son. And as time uh, went by, uh, she there came a time when they came up to the feast, and little Samuel stayed behind. And uh, from year to year, his parents would would come up and visit. But Samuel, uh, probably at around the age of six or seven, uh, stayed there and lived in Shiloh, and had a little. Uh, apartment adjacent there to Eli and served as a, as a servant to Eli, to the high priest, and grew up there as a Nazarite training uh, to uh, serve God in, in a very special way. Now, as time went on, uh, we find, of course, that Eli's uh, uh, sons had set a horrible example. They, they were uh, corrupt uh, up and down. And yet, uh, Samuel as a young child growing up, was very uh, uh, very much attuned to God and to God's ways. And you read in chapter 3 that uh, one night uh, Samuel perhaps this time gone up around 12 years old or so. We're not told exactly how old. But uh, anyway, he was there and he was asleep or had lay down and he heard a voice that uh, called for him. And uh, Samuel said, here I am. And he got up, went in there where Eli was and uh, Eli said, I, I didn't call you. you. You're just dreaming. Go back and lie down. So he went back and he lay down. And sure enough, it happened again. Samuel, Samuel. Well, Samuel got up and he went back in there to Eli. And this happened. After, when it happened the third time, Eli realized it. He realized that God was communicating with Samuel. God was talking to Samuel. Now, you have to understand that was quite a blow because Eli was the high priest. And if God was going to talk to anyone, Eli would have normally been the one that it would have been expected that God would have communicated through because that was part of the role of the high priest. But Eli had allowed something very serious to happen. He had allowed his sons to continue in their office though he knew how corrupt they were. He knew how corrupt they were. And... He had sort of mildly corrected them or sort of told them, well, now, boys, you shouldn't be doing this. And, of course, they just laughed at that. And they went on and did what they wanted to. And Eli couldn't bring, it, bring himself to take action against his sons. And so he allowed things to go on and brought uh, the, the uh, tabernacle of God, brought the priesthood uh, into disrepute among the people, caused a lowering of respect in the eyes of the people for all of this. And yet Samuel, uh, when he went back, Eli told him when he realized what, that God was calling him, he said, when, when you hear it again, if it comes again, you respond and says, uh, you know, speak, Lord, your servant hears. So Samuel went back and he was sort of nervous and lay down. And you can imagine, you know, probably laying there with his eyes wide open, uh, you know, wondering what was going to happen next. And, and sure enough, a voice came and Samuel responded and God spoke to Samuel and God told Samuel, that because Eli had in effect placed his sons above him, that God was going to remove the priesthood from the family of Eli, that his sons were going to die, and that Eli's family would not continue the priesthood. You can imagine, Samuel. that was not a message Samuel wanted to deliver the next day. But Eli put him on the spot and, and insisted that he tell him, and so Samuel did. And we're told that as Samuel grew down here in chapter 3 and verse 19, the Lord was with him. And in verse 20, all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. You know, he simply did what he was supposed to do. And as the years went by, as he grew on up through adolescence, uh, people had respect because they could see he's different than the others. And God began to work through him. Because he was responsive to God. Now, as we come on down, let's look at how far the nation had gotten off the track. And you don't find that Eli was so much personally corrupt. There's no indication that he was, uh, you know, doing all the same things that his sons were doing. But he wouldn't put his foot down. He wouldn't deal with the problems. And so he allowed a situation to fester and to get worse, and ultimately he has to take responsibility for it. We find that 
uh, Israel went out to battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines uh, came and uh, uh, defeated, the, uh, defeated Israel. And the people were sort of upset and thought, well, why in the world uh, would God let us lose? You know, why? We're God's people. God, God shouldn't let us lose. So they put their heads together and guess what they came up with? They said, I know what to do. Verse 3, chapter 4. Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us. And when it comes among us, it may save us out of the hands of our enemies. Oh, I know what we can do. Let's get the ark. It's down there in Shiloh in the tabernacle. Let's bring the ark up here. We'll bring the ark and we'll take it. God will have to take care of it. God will have to take care of the ark. The ark is God's ark. Why, God, you know, that's got the tables of stone, the, 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 the covenant. The tables of the covenant. That's the ark of the covenant. The tables of the covenant written on with the very finger of the hand of God. That's in the ark. Why, God won't let anything happen to the ark. You know, that's the symbol of God's presence. Of course, they sort of viewed it that that, that was where God was. All they had to do was bring God. They thought they could bring God out to battle. Well, it didn't happen that way. What you find as you go on through chapter 4 is that the ark was captured by the Philistines that day. 30,000 Israelites fell on the field of battle that day. And among those who were slain were Phinehas and Hophni, the two sons of Eli. A runner came back to Shiloh, and Eli had been very upset, nervous at the idea of them taking the ark, hadn't wanted them to do it, but his sons uh, had jumped up and said, yeah, we'll do it, and so they, they did it. You see, Eli had never restrained them when he was in a position to and the time came when he wasn't. And they just sort of grabbed it out from under him. What was he going to do? Well, he sat up there and he worried and stewed about it. And they came back and uh, uh, told him that Israel had been smitten. And he said, what happened to the ark? Where's the ark? And he said, well, it's been taken. And your sons are dead. When he heard about the ark, he, he had been apprehensive. He knew this was not right. And he had either a heart attack or a stroke, just fell over, uh, fell off of this uh, high perch on which he was seated, uh, broke his neck and died. He was uh, quite heavy and he was also uh, very elderly. He was 98 years of age, we're told here in First Samuel 4, uh, 15. So here, all of this happens. Now the Philistines have captured the ark. Israel thought they could ensure their safety and security by bringing the ark out there. And guess what? The ark didn't protect them, did it? Now, the Philistines had the ark, and they discovered something. You know, sometimes it's easier to grab a tiger by the tail than it is to turn him loose. Uh, and this was the predicament in which they found themselves. First, they were glad they got it. Oh, boy, we've captured the God of Israel. So they brought the ark up here as a trophy. See, you're going to set it up in the house of Dagon, their god. And they set it up in there as a little trophy, you know, and went to bed that night. Got up the next morning to come pray to Dagon, and they found old Dagon had fallen off his perch. And uh, he was fallen down, uh, bowed on his face, as it were, before the ark. Now, this was sort of embarrassing, you know. It looked like their god was worshiping the god of Israel. Uh, so they, got, they picked their god up, sort of dusted him off, and set him back up on his perch. Then they could bow down to him and pray to him, see, uh, after they had fixed it. And uh, so they uh, they became just a tad nervous. Well, the next morning, they went on through the 24 hours. They got up the next day and they went in there. Dagon had fallen off his perch again. This time his head had broken off and, his, and the palms of his hands had broken off. They're on the threshold and there wasn't anything left of Dagon but the stump. And at that point, uh, they began to be more than just a tad nervous. And right along this line... The uh, uh, where, where we find verse 6, they had brought the ark to Ashdod. Ashdod, you know, there were five great cities of the Philistines. And of course, this was quite a trophy of war. This was the symbol of having absolutely conquered Israel. They had conquered the most precious thing. They had taken the most precious thing in Israel. They had the ark. They had heard all kinds of stories about the ark. And they had it. 
So you can imagine, you know, a little bit of rivalry. And Ashdod said, we're the most important city. We had the biggest army out here. We're taking it to Ashdod. It's going to be a trophy in the temple of Dagon. Well, in uh, verse 6 of chapter 5, we read that the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod, and he destroyed them and smote them with hemorrhoids, uh, even Ashdod and the coast thereof. And I'll tell you, it wasn't too long before the men of Ashdod uh, saw that it was so, and they said, uh, the ark of the God of Israel shall not abide with us. I don't think we want this thing around here anymore. Uh, doesn't say how long it took them to get to the point, but, uh, you know, they became, uh, uh, things became painful enough. So they said, uh, what are we going to do? So they got everybody together and said, you know, this is really an honor to have this ark. And we feel like we're selfish, you know, just sort of holding it all for ourselves. Gath is a great city, and we feel like we've been disrespectful to Gath. We're going to let you take the ark down to Gath. Well, they brought it down to Gath, and uh, uh, we find that the hand of the Lord was heavy against the city. And he smote the men of the city, small and great, and they had hemorrhoids. Uh-oh. Well, it doesn't say how long it took them in Gath, but verse 10, we find they sent the ark of God to Ekron. And, you know, in Gath, they said, uh, I think we've had about all the prosperity we can handle, uh, about all the honor and the glory that we need for a while. Let's send it on down the road. So they sent it on down to Ekron. Well, the, uh, the Ekronites, by this time, see, word had spread. And they began to realize, you can't keep something like this uh, under wraps. So they, they, they began to realize this was not a good thing. And so uh, they, uh, when it got down to Ekron, they said, look, we don't want it. And then they said, well, what are we going to do with it? You know, we've already made the God of Israel mad. And if we do, so, if we do the wrong thing to the ark, then we're going to be really in trouble. You know, we're going, we, we don't want, we're in bad enough shape as it is. We don't want to be in worse. So they, began, they, they had a real problem on their hands. Uh, none of them wanted the ark. They were happy to give it back. They just didn't know how to get rid of it. They didn't know what to do. And so they put their heads together and, and uh, uh, we find that there was, a, uh, you know, some sort of great plague. And uh, verse 12, the men that died not uh, were smitten with hemorrhoids and the cry of the city went up to heaven. Uh, the things were, were really miserable around there. And evidently there were a number that died of some sort of plague. So... Um, uh, the ark of, of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And they called for the priests and the diviners. And th the biggest problem they had was trying to figure out how to get rid of it. What are we going to do? How are we going to send it? Uh, where are we going to send it? And then they said, well, if we send it away empty, uh, you know, we better send some sort of trespass offering. We better let, we better let the God of Israel know we're sorry. Uh, that, because we might be in worse trouble. And they didn't quite know what to do. So they finally, in verse 4, you find that they made five golden hemorrhoids and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. Uh, so this was the final conclusion they came up with. Put those things, uh, made these little images, uh, and uh, they put them, in a, put them in a little box, uh, and they thought, well, they would present that to the God of Israel for a trespass. So they, they decided that they would put, it on, put the ark on a cart and, and send it back. Well, they said, now, we don't want to just put it on any old cart, you know. Uh, some old cart that people have used to haul junk around. Why, well, God might be insulted about that. We'll build a new cart. We'll, make, we'll get brand new lumber, fresh lumber, never hauled anything. We'll build a brand new cart. And we'll put the ark in the cart. And we'll put our little box with the five golden mice and the five golden hemorrhoids. We'll put those that little box in the back of the cart there, and that'll be the offering. And uh, how? what are we going to do with the cart? Well... We'll get a couple of milk cows. We'll get a couple of cows that have just had a calf. Uh, we don't know where to send it, so we'll let the God of Israel figure out where to send it. We'll let him take care of that. So they took these two cows. They just had calves. And uh, they put the calves up. And these cows had never been yoked up. They'd never been used as, as uh, cart animals. But they yoked them up. Now you can imagine, you know, something like this. If you've ever fool with cattle, you can imagine trying to uh, yoke up a couple of uh, a couple of cows this way that have just had a calf, and you lock the calf up in the barn, and the cows take off down the road, we're told down here, uh, as, you, uh, as you come on down, uh, and uh, 
tells in verse 10, you know, that they took the, the two milk cows and tied them to the cart, shut up the calves at home, and uh, verse 12, the cows took the straight way to the way of Beth Shemesh. Can you imagine, you know, a cow just, boy, he is going just, he went along the highway, lowing as they went, and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. Well, you can just imagine these old cows. You know, they, they couldn't quite figure out what was going on. Uh, maybe there was an angel leading them along or something. Something must have been there to make them go straight. But they were just bawling for all they were worth. Uh, their, their, uh, their calves were back there. And they just went on down the road, made a straight straight line the other direction. The lords of the Philistines uh, sort of uh, crept along looking. You know, they were trying to figure out where it was going. Well, the ark came back. And it stopped at this uh, uh, locale, uh, Kerjath uh, Jehoram, uh, is, uh, um, is, the, is the Israelite city near where they uh, stopped. So anyway, they came and they got it. Now we're told in verse 2 of chapter 7 that it abided there uh, about 20 years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. In verse 3, Samuel spoke unto all the house of Israel, saying, If you do return unto the eternal with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and the Ashtaroth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only, and he'll deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. And children of Israel put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and served the eternal only. And... So we find that uh, uh, they Israel smote the uh, the Philistines. Now, notice the problem here. They the Israelites said, "Well, I don't see why God let us. I can't imagine. You know, God let His people be defeated and let us go through all this suffering. Notice what they had. Samuel told them. He said, "Look, if you want to, if you want independence, if you want to defeat the Philistines." And the first thing you better do is repent. Put away the strange gods. He didn't tell them bring the ark out and use it for a good luck charm. He said, you better repent. You've got all these little idols and these little crosses and these little things. That's what Ashtaroth are if you look them up. Uh, it, it was uh, these little pagan uh, insignias and things that uh, uh, that were there. All these symbols of Baal worship and, and the uh, worship of Astarte, the goddess of spring, also known as Ishtar or Easter, depends on uh, uh, the area in the Middle East where you were as to the exact name, but it was all the uh, goddess of spring. These little symbols. They had all this, this junk, this pagan paraphernalia that they had accumulated from the world around Samuel said, if you want God's blessing, you better repent. Put all that stuff away. Get rid of it. You see, that's the starting point. You've got to serve God. You've got to be devoted to God. You've got to put, you've got to return to the Lord with all your heart. And if you do return to the Lord with all your heart, then you start by putting away the strange God. You know, isn't that what Jacob told his family when he went to renew his covenant with God at Bethel? He dug a hole under the oak tree and he said, bring me all the strange gods, let's bury them here. We've got to get rid of these things. So you can't take strange gods with you if you're going to worship the true God. You can't hold on to little bits of paganism. You can't hold on to the world and walk with God at the same time. The people weren't walking with God. They had departed from God. They, Oh, it says here, you know, that uh, they lamented all these years after the Lord. They talked about God. They paid lip service to God. They spoke of God. Why is God letting us go through all this? Why doesn't God take care of us? Samuel finally told him, he said, look, if you're really serious, you need to make some changes in your life. You see, Israel of old, this is just one example, we could go to others. They derive their sense of security from the equivalent of a good luck charm. That's, that's really what they, that's the way they viewed the ark. 
They had missed the point of the ark and of the covenant and of the tables of the covenant. God didn't give them the two tables of stone so that they could bow down and worship it. He gave them the two tables of stone with the Ten Commandments written there so they could keep it. So they could obey what it said. It wasn't given as a good luck charm. It wasn't given as an idol. It was given as a guide to life. They didn't use it as a guide to life. They missed the point. And this is, this is a very important concept because it really gets down to the true worship of God. The true worship of God. The real basis of our security, Israel missed the point. And God did not deliver them until they got the point, which was that they needed to turn to God with all their heart, with all their minds. That's what he said here. He told them to prepare your hearts unto the Lord. To return to the Lord with all your hearts, to put away the strange gods, to prepare your heart to the Lord and serve Him only. Now you think about that. You see, return is really, that just means to repent. Return unto the Lord with all your hearts. He didn't say you start by doing this or not doing that. The starting point is you've got to return to God in your heart. It doesn't matter what physical actions you go through. If you haven't returned to God in your heart, the physical actions are temporary. You can start doing this and stop doing that, but if the return didn't begin in the heart, it won't last. Sometimes people get in the jam and they make promises to God. Oh, I, you know, boy, I'll, I'll come to church or I'll do this or I'll do that. And they may do it for a while. But you first, the first real key is you've got to return to God in your heart. You've got to return. And the word return uh, simply is, is equivalent to repent. See, to turn around, to go the other way, to, to return, to come back. We, we come back in our heart. That's the starting place. Now, it doesn't stop there. You see, it doesn't spiritualize away and say, well, I don't really have to keep the law because, you know, I, I, I do it in my heart. No, he says, return to the Lord with all your hearts. Then, put away the strange gods. You see, yes, you start making physical changes, but you start by making spiritual changes. Unfortunately, what some people did was they made the physical changes, but they never returned in their heart. They never changed in their heart. They quit doing this. They started doing that as a matter of external pressure or as a matter that they thought, you know, God was going to get them if they didn't or God would, would, would bless them if they did. But they didn't return in their heart. You see, you start by returning in your heart. The next thing you do is you put... If you really return in your heart, then it will be demonstrated in your actions. You start putting away the strange God. You get rid of the paganism that has been accumulated, of the strange gods. Then you prepare your heart unto the Lord. You seek to become receptive to God and to His influence. And then you serve Him. Boom. You obey Him. You keep His commandments. You walk with Him. But you see, it is a combination of what is in the heart and mind and what is in outward action. And the two have to go together. Samuel told them the solution to their problem was not to trot the ark out there, thinking somehow they could hold God hostage. The solution was to make changes from the inside out. Now, they didn't learn the lesson all that well. I mean, time went on, and you can read the story, and you'll find that uh, uh, they had their ups and downs and, and the lessons were not learned that well, but we'll come on down from the days of Samuel. Uh, we'll come on down about 500 years, a little over 500 years, and we uh, come here to Jeremiah chapter 7. Now, in Jeremiah chapter 7, we will pick up the story about 500 years after the events that we were just reading in 1 Samuel 7. Now, since that time, a temple has been built. 
temple was built over 350 years earlier uh, that uh, had been built by King Saul. And the temple was there and the ark was in the temple. And you remember the temple God had set his name there. In fact, the glory of God had so filled the temple uh, that the priest couldn't even come in during the dedication ceremony. You remember the, the story of how the glory of God literally filled the house. And God placed his name there. God accepted that. Now, and we're down in the time of Jeremiah. The Babylonians have been threatening the city of Jerusalem. They have taken captive many of the cities of Judah. And there are people there in Jerusalem, in the city of Jerusalem, who feel secure. They believe that they're protected because they're in the city of Jerusalem. And after all, Jerusalem is God's city. That's where God said his name. That's where the temple is. That's where the ark is. God is duty-bound to protect it, right? Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word. And say, hear the word of the Lord, all you Judah that enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Trust you not in lying words, saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment uh, between a man and his neighbor, Oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, the widow. Shed not innocent blood in this place. Neither walk after other gods to your hurt. Then will I cause you to dwell in this place in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal and murder and commit adultery and swear falsely and burn incense unto Baal and walk after other gods whom you have not known and come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations? Is this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your sight? Behold, even I have seen it, says the Lord. Go you now unto my place that was in Shiloh. For I set my name at the first and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. And now, because you have done all these works, says the Lord, and I spoke unto you rising up early and speaking, but you heard not, and I called you, but you answered not. Therefore will I do unto this house, which is called by my name, wherein you trust, and unto the place which I gave to you and your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. And I'll cast you out of my sight as I've cast all of your brethren, even the whole house of Israel, of, of Ephraim. Notice the problem. They put their trust, their sense of security. It was in the wrong thing. They said, hey, the temple of the Lord. Temple of the Lord. Why, we're right here where the temple is. This is God's city. This is Jerusalem. God will protect us. Jeremiah said, you've been up to Shiloh lately? Anybody taking a trip up to Shiloh lately? You seen what that looks like? You just plowed the field. He said, that's where I set my name at the first. That's where Joshua set the tabernacle up. That's where the ark was, remember? It's not there now. There's nothing there now. You see, brethren, you don't hold God hostage. Jeremiah told him, he said, you want God's protection? You want God's protection to mend your ways and your doings? Amend your ways and your doings. You know, you've got to repent. You've got to change. You've got to return to God. That was what, that was pointed at yet. Well, we find it over and over. You see, even under the old covenant, what did God want? What did God require? Well, Joshua told the people of Israel, this was back when Shiloh was first established. God first set up a headquarters, set up a tabernacle at a specific spot. In Joshua chapter 24, 14, Joshua said, Now therefore fear the Eternal and serve Him in sincerity and in truth. 
and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the, the flood or the other side of the Euphrates and in Egypt and serve you the eternal. Told them on down. Well, you notice what happened. See, God says, I want you to serve me in sincerity and truth. Or is it sometimes stated in spirit and in truth? That's what God wanted. But people have wanted to put their trust in what they could see and what they could touch and what seemed real to them. See, the ark seemed more real than God did. People have a desire, it seems, to derive their security from what is seen rather than from a relationship with the invisible God. And they missed the point. There was a distortion that had come in. And you, you read of it in John 4. You remember the story of Christ meeting the woman at the well uh, there in Samaria? And uh, uh, the disciples had gone into the village uh, there to... Uh, had gone into the village to uh, to buy bread, and uh, um, they had uh, Christ had stayed there at the well. A woman came, and he inquired of a drink of water. Uh, inquired for a drink of water, and she was a little bit surprised that here was a Jewish man asking her for something. Uh, and so there was a little bit of a conversation exchange, and uh, uh, she said, uh, or Christ said to her, he said, uh, this is in John 4, um, he said, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that said to you, give me a drink, you, you would ask of him and he would give you living water. The woman said, well, sir, the well is deep. You don't have anything to draw with. Where are you going to get this living water? And they began to talk back and forth uh, a little bit. And Christ said to her in verse 16, well, I tell you what, go call your husband. And she said, oh, um, I'm not married. He said, right. You've had five husbands and the one you're living with, you're not married to. And at that point, she changed the subject. Uh, she said, you know, I, you must be a prophet. I'll tell you what, I've got a Bible question. I've just been waiting to ask somebody. Uh, she really did not want to discuss her marital status. You sort of get that point. Uh, you, you know, she immediately came up with a Bible question and said, Sir, I, I perceive you're a prophet. Boy, I've got this Bible question. I've, I, you know, I'm really pretty religious, and I, I study the Bible and everything, and I've got this question, and I've just been dying to ask somebody. Our fathers worship in this mountain, over here in Mount Gerizim, where we have a temple, and you Jews say that Jerusalem is the place where a man ought to worship. Now, which is which? Christ said, the hour is coming when you shall neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem worship the Father. You see, the, it was just a matter of time. The Romans were going to come in and level Mount Gerizim. They were going to come in and destroy the temple in Jerusalem. And it was going to be a totally moot point as to whether you went to Gerizim or, the, or Jerusalem because neither one was going to be there. So that issue was going to be solved very quickly. Within a matter of years, the Roman legions uh, came in and just decimated the area and people were scattered. But then Christ went on to tell her, he said, you Samaritans worship you know not what. We Jews know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. The, the, the proper scriptures have been preserved by the Jews in Jerusalem. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth and the Father seeks such to worship Him. You see, the question was going to be solved because Mount Gerizim and Jerusalem were neither going to be available for worship and within a short time. But even at that time as they spoke, the true worshipers worship the Father in spirit and in truth. It wasn't just simply a matter of being at a geographical location. Now, Gerizim was not the place that God had chosen. God had worked through the Jews and not through the Samaritans. But still, you could go through the motions of going to Jerusalem and still miss the point. The true worshipers worship the Father in spirit and in truth. You see, they 
were not those who were seeking a good luck charm as in the days of Samuel or the days of Jeremiah. They worshipped the Father in spirit and in truth. Verse 24, God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And this is a very important concept to understand because this is the, you know, this is the key. We're told in Hebrews 13, 14 that we have here no continuing city, but we look for one that is to come. Now, the Jews had a continuing city. They had Jerusalem. And they looked to Jerusalem, and uh, they felt that this was some place that they could always look to and, and know where God was. You know, where God was, all they had to do was look to Jerusalem. Paul told them in Hebrews 13, 14, just a few years before the Roman troops came in and destroyed Jerusalem, he said, here we have no continuing city. We seek one that is to come. The continuing city we have, the city that will abide forever, our continuing city is the new Jerusalem, which ultimately will come down out of heaven from God to the earth and will dwell in it. Abraham looked for a city that had foundation, whose maker and builder is God. No continuing city. But there is a continuing truth. There is the basis of a continuing relationship with God. There is the basis of a lot of things. But there is not simply a continuing you know, up until that time, not only was the temple in Jerusalem, but that's where the headquarters church was. That's where the apostles were. That's where everyone looked, where they came back to. That was going to be over with within a relatively short period of time. The city would be destroyed and the people would be scattered. So true worship has always been worship in spirit and in truth. That was true under the old covenant and it is true under the new covenant. Now, what does it mean to worship in spirit and in truth? Brethren, has the truth changed? Has the truth changed? That's an important question to, to uh, uh, ask because uh, it deals with a pretty it deals with a pretty important subject. The uh, We're told in, in 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 24, 1 Peter 1, 24. All flesh is as grass. All the glory of man is the glory of grass. The grass withers and the flower thereof falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Flesh is like grass. You know, it happens a little quicker with grass, but that's the only difference. You see it blo you see it growing, you see it blossom, you see it bloom, you see uh, the little flowers, you see all of these things, and it's here and it's gone, and it turns brown and it dies. That's the way flesh is. See, the glory of man is as the glory of the grass. Oh, that's, that's sort of a humbling thought. Is all the pomp, all the glory, just like the grass, it fades. But the word of the Lord endures forever. God's word endures. Now Jesus said in John seventeen seventeen, "Thy word is truth." Thy word is truth. The word of the Lord endures forever. So the truth of God endures forever. You know, we're, we're various places we could look that could uh, uh, tell us that uh, back in Psalm 119, verse 142, your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. Your law is the truth. Your law is the truth. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. We're told down in verse 160, Psalm 119, your word is true from the beginning. And every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Well, we could we could go on. With, there, there are various places uh, that uh, that uh, uh, that we could look 
uh, that tell us that uh, not only does the word of the Lord endure forever, we're, we're told that his truth endures to all generations. God's truth endures for all generations. God's word is true from the beginning. Uh, you, you know, on and on. We could we could go, we could look. The true worship of God under the Old Covenant and the true worship of God under the New Covenant are to be worship based on worship in spirit and in truth. Christ said at the time he spoke to the woman at the well, he said, the true worshipers, you know, the, the hour is coming and now is. The true worshipers must worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Joshua told them centuries ago, Joshua told them what? Uh, almost 1,400 years before Christ spoke, 14 centuries earlier, Joshua said, serve the eternal in sincerity and truth. Still the same thing. Now, what does that mean to worship God, spirit, and truth? You know, that's a nice sounding phrase, but, but how do you, how does it apply? What does it mean? How, how do you, how do you worship God in truth? What, what does that convey? I want to show you something that I think can help make it plain. Back in Exodus chapter 25, Moses was in the mountain and God was giving Moses instruction. He was giving him instruction concerning worship. And in Exodus 25, verse 8, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show you, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. So he says, according to the pattern that I show you. God established the pattern. God didn't tell Moses, I want you to just sort of figure out what you think would be a good way to worship me. I want you to come up with a nice pattern and figure out instruments of worship and various items connected with worship. Uh, maybe you can look and see what the Egyptians do and they'll give you a few ideas. And, you know, the Canaanites have some interesting customs. They, they have some, uh, some sort of quaint traditions. And you might look and see the way they do it and maybe send somebody back to Babylonia and find out how the Babylonians do it. Maybe get some ideas as to how to build a tabernacle and how to build an ark. No, God says, according to all that I show you after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of the instruments, even so shall you make it. Now, to really get a, a, a feel for the importance of this and what it signified, let's come on over to Hebrews 8. In Hebrews 8, Paul is talking initially about the various items of worship. And he says in verse 5, Hebrews 8, these things serve under the example and shadow of heavenly things. Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. See, says he, that you make all things according to the pattern showed to you in the mount. Oh no, we just read that. See, that you make all things according to the pattern showed to you in the mount. You follow the model, you follow the example that God established. God showed Moses how to do it, and it actually signified heavenly things. It was, uh, God patterned it after things that were there at his throne in heaven. And he told Moses, I want you to exactly follow the pattern I give you. You follow my pattern. Well, let's go back a little bit. Let's go back to 2 Kings. Now let's notice an example. Let's see, you know how human reasoning comes in. Now time has gone by, and we're coming on down here, um, back uh, maybe in the uh, uh, mid-700s, around 750 or so uh, B.C., that Ahaz, from 2 Kings 16, Ahaz becomes king, king of Judah. And uh, uh, he was 
the father of Hezekiah. We're more familiar with King Hezekiah. Uh, but Ahaz was not a good king. We're told in 2 Kings 16.2 that he did that which was not, he did not do that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. He made his son to pass through fire according to the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel. He sacrificed and burned incense in high places and on the hills and under every green tree. And, of course, he had problems. He had problems, you know, all kind of difficulties. And the king of Israel went to war with him and the Syrians went to war with him and he was having trouble. And uh, he lost territory and he was just coming out on the bad end all the way around. And so in verse 7 of 2 Kings 16, he gets an idea. He sent a messenger to tiglath Pileser, who was the king of Assyria. And he said, look, he said, I'm your servant and your son. I'll do anything you want. Just please come up here and deliver me. Help me out. Be my ally. In verse 8, he took the silver and the gold that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house, and he sent it for a present to the king of Assyria. I don't know that the letter did so much good, but when the king of Assyria saw all the gold and the silver, he thought that maybe he could be inclined uh, to go down there and beat up on the Syrians and the Israelites and uh, see if there was any loot left. So he uh, came on down. Uh, verse 9, the king of Assyria hearkened to him. He went up against Damascus and took it. and carried the people captive and slew the king. So, you know, you pay him enough, he was glad to go down and butcher a few people. Uh, he sort of looked for an excuse to do that anyway and just annex Syria. Well, Ahaz, verse 10, went up to Damascus to meet tiglath pileser king of Assyria, and he saw an altar that was at Damascus. And King Ahaz sent to Uriah the priest the fashion of the altar and the pattern of it according to all the workmanship. And Uriah the priest built an altar according to all that King Ahaz had sent from Damascus. And he made it before King Ahaz got back. When the king returned from Damascus, he saw the altar. And the king approached the altar and he offered thereon. And he burned his burnt offering and his meat offering and poured his drink offering. And he did all this stuff. And he took the brazen altar, which was before the Lord. The one that Moses had, had built. He took that from the forefront of the house, from between the altar and the house of the Lord. And he put it on the north side of the altar that he had built. He stuck it over there sort of in a corner. And he said, now on the great altar, the big one that I built, that we patterned after Damascus, you burn all the offerings and the sacrifices. And uh, uh, I'll use this brazen offer, altar to inquire by. So he was using that for purposes of divination and, and sort of fortune telling, uh, soothsaying, that sort of thing. Uh, he, he was going to use that for superstitious purposes. And he doctored things up. He thought, we, we find various things that he did. Then he died, verse 20. Now, notice what happened. God gave Moses the pattern in the mountain. And he said, I want you to build everything exactly according to the pattern that I give you. Well, we come on along years later and we find Ahaz goes to Damascus and he likes the pattern they have. And so he copies the pattern and he sends it down to Jerusalem and he says, let's build a new altar. Let's replace the one that Moses built. Let's follow the pattern that we got from Damascus. Let's follow the world's pattern and use it to replace God's pattern. Second Chronicles 28 picks up the story. Chronicles is a parallel account. We find here in Second Chronicles 28.1, Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, reigned 16 years. We find in verse... Uh, uh, Two, that he made molten images for Baal. Uh, in verse 3, he burned incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom, burned his children in the fire after the abominations of the heathen, sacrificed, burned incense in the high places and on the hills, did all these things. God delivered him to the hand of, of the king of Assyria, the king of Syria, and we've already read that story. The, uh, uh, we find all these things that he did in 
verse uh, uh, 22, we're told, in the time of his distress did he trespass yet more against the Lord. This is that King Ahab. He sacrificed unto the gods of Damascus, which smote him. He figured, you know, the gods of Damascus must really be strong, boy. They, they won the battle. They beat me. I'll, I'll use that as a pattern. That was real swift thinking. Why? He could see things were going badly for him, but he didn't manage to get his cause and effect properly connected. He was impressed with the world. And what God had given him seemed pretty trivial, pretty insignificant. Verse 24, he gathered together the vessels of the house of God, cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God, shut up the doors of the house, and made him altars in every corner of Jerusalem. Now we're told in verse 29 that Hezekiah was 25 when he began to reign. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Verse 3, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the, the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them brought in the priests and the Levites, told them to sanctify themselves and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. Because our fathers have trespassed. And all these things have happened. So you find that in verse 16, the priests went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it, brought out the uncleanness which they found uh, from the temple and in the court. They took it to carry it abroad under the brook Kidron. And they began to pile all this stuff up. They carried it out. They cleaned the place up to be rededicated. Ahaz derived his pattern for worship from the world. You see, the, to worship God in truth means you worship God in accordance with the pattern that He has established. You don't get your pattern for worship from the world. You don't look and see how they did it in Damascus. God told Moses how to do it. And that wasn't good enough for Ahaz. If you're going to worship God in truth, you're going to have to worship Him in accordance with the pattern that He's established. See, that's fundamental. You have to worship God in accordance with the pattern that He's established, but you have to do more than that. Because you remember Christ said, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will in no ways enter the kingdom. You remember he said that back in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5? How? What, what did he mean by that? Well, let's notice Isaiah 29. Isaiah 29, verse 13. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near unto me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Wherefore I'll, do, I'll proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. God said the people draw near with their mouth and with their lips, but have removed their heart far from me. Back in... Mark chapter 7. Quote this. Mark 7. The Pharisees were demanding of Christ in Mark 7 verse 5 why he didn't uh, follow the tradition of the elders. Didn't follow the customs. These weren't laws from the Old Testament. These were customs and traditions they had come up with in the last hundred years or so. And he answered and he said in verse 6 of Mark 7, Well, as Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Laying aside the commandments of God, you hold the tradition of men. He told them in verse 9 that they rejected the commandments of God to hold on to their own tradition. They honored him with their lips, but their heart was far from him. You see, brethren, acceptable worship to God is worship in spirit and in truth. That means what? It means you have to worship God in accordance with the pattern he's established, and it has to be from the heart. You worship God in accordance with the pattern he's established from the heart. 
That's what God expects and requires all the way from Genesis to Revelation. Old Covenant, New Covenant. God says to His people, I want you to worship Me in accordance with the pattern that I've established. Don't get your pattern from the world. You worship Me in accordance with the pattern I've established. So you worship Him in truth. God sets the pattern and we follow the pattern and it has to be from the heart. You can go through the motions of following the pattern and it still wouldn't count. You've got to follow the pattern from the heart. From the heart. You see, you find when you go through Hebrews 11, various men and women of faith that are cataloged from the time of the Old Testament. And we read of Moses that he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, but seeing him who is invisible. Moses left Egypt in his heart. And he never ever turned back. Moses didn't want what was back there. He turned his back on it in his mind and in his heart. What we find is that the people in general turned their back on it physically and walked out, but they kept looking back. They really wanted to hold on to what was back there. They liked some of it. They never totally came out of it. They didn't in their mind. Brethren, if you and I have not come out of the world in our minds, God doesn't tell us to go off and sit in a cave somewhere. But coming out of the world is something that you, you have to do in your mind. You've got to turn your back on the world's value system. You can't dabble your toe in the cesspool. It just won't work. Well, sometimes people want to get as close as they can get. They don't want to fall all the way in and drown. They just sort of like to dangle their toes in it. You know, just sort of lean over. It's certainly not the spirit of the law. It reminds me, years ago, my wife and I were first married and we had a cat. And, and you know, you can teach uh, a cat certain things. And one of the things we had uh, done is there was an imaginary line beyond which we wouldn't allow the cat to come. And a cat knew that. Uh, when we were there, you would see him, you know, sit. He would get right up on this line in the floor, as it were, right up on the imaginary line. We'd get as close as he could, sort of lean over. Uh, he uh, did not have a concept of the spirit of the law. In fact, when our backs were turned, uh, you know, we were back in the rest of the house, the little cat would creep over the line and come where he wasn't supposed to. And if he heard us, uh, you could all of a sudden hear the scurry of feet as he was uh, uh, taking off and heading back to get uh, there on the other side of the, of the yellow line. But uh, uh, there, there is an approach. See, God is doing something in us. He calls us to worship Him in spirit and in truth because God made us in His image after His likeness God's purpose is that we will enter into His family. God is writing His laws in our hearts and in our minds. And as we approach this day of Pentecost, a time that puts our focus on the law of God and on the Spirit of God and on the covenants of God, when God gave the commandment and He wrote them with His finger in tables of stone, they were indelible. They were permanent in tables of stone, but they were external. And that was a start, but God wanted to take it from being external to making it internal. You know, God, it's not a test that God got a good grade on, but He didn't get a perfect score. You know, some people think that the Ten Commandments were all right. You know, if they were grading God, they'd give Him 90%. Uh, you know, they'd take nine out of the ten and sort of take uh, one out of the middle. You know, God got most of them right. He, he, did, he only missed one. Uh, you know, that's not too bad. Well, uh, that, that's not the case. You know, God didn't just get nine out of ten uh, and, and sort of take the fourth one out and throw that one away. No, God got ten out of ten. And He wrote them with His finger in tables of stone. 
But his ultimate purpose was to write them with his spirit in the tables of our heart and of our mind. We have to be receptive to that. God does this through his spirit. You know, Christ told, gave a parable, gave an illustration in which in Matthew 25, one we're familiar with, he talked about the ten virgins. I don't want to go all into the parable of the ten virgins, but I would simply call your attention to the question, are we wise virgins or foolish virgins? You know, the foolish virgins were virtually out of oil. They were running, their lamps were going out. The wise had oil in the lamp. Oil is used as a symbol of God's Holy Spirit. You know, right now at this point, we have the opportunity of wising up. You see, God's Spirit is available to us as we seek it, but you've got to spend time with God. You've got to spend time in prayer and in Bible study and really allowing God to work in you and through you. The only way God's law will ever be written in our heart is through the power of His Spirit. Brethren, we have the opportunity to wise up. We have the opportunity to worship God in spirit and truth. He's called us out at this time. He is in the process of making with us a new covenant. Not one in which he does away with the law, but one in which he writes the law in the tables of our heart and of our mind. Which he begins a transformation from the inside out. He is changing us as we yield to him. Paul describes it in Romans, uh, or in 2 Corinthians, rather, 2 Corinthians 3. He, changed, he describes it that we're being changed from glory unto glory. You remember that back in, in 2 Corinthians 3, I think, uh, right around uh, verse uh, uh, verse 18. We all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. We're being changed. We're undergoing a transformation by the power of God's Spirit. What we should be seeing is our image converging with that of Jesus Christ. That we're becoming more like Him by degrees, step by step. God is changing us. He's transforming us. But brethren, we have to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Not relegating God to being a good luck charm. Something to sort of drag out and dust off when we get in trouble. Not feeling that you can sort of stick God in a box and take Him with you in that way. But realizing we've got to walk with God, we've got to walk with God and serve Him in sincerity and in truth and serve Him according to the pattern that He's established from the heart. And that is crucial. That is important. And we have for us ahead an unfading glory. An unfading glory. We're being changed from glory to glory. We're being changed by degree unto the same image by the Spirit of the Lord. We're being transformed. So as we approach Pentecost, and as we are in the Pentecost season, let's be deeply mindful of what has changed and what hasn't changed. Let's be deeply mindful of what God is doing for us, in us, and through us under the terms of the new covenant. Let's respond to that by going to God to fill our lamps, seeking to respond to Him and to worship Him according to the pattern that He's established from the heart. And as we do, we will experience that gradual transformation from glory to glory by degree by God's Spirit working in us, changing and transforming us into His 